My father was a very strong figure in my life as he raised me. In my life, as he raised us to believe in human rights. All Quakers were supposed were supporters of equal rights for law, and many maintained a stop along the Underground Railroad assisting runaway slaves. I remember when I was very young, about seven years old, we had a visit from my cousin. She was very upset and crying. She had come to ask for my father's help, as my father was a lawyer. You see, she had been widowed with small children and was left an inheritance by her deceased husband. In those days, the law stated that when a woman with children and wealth remarried, her new husband would have control of the children and wealth. My cousin had discovered that her new husband was an alcoholic and had spent their entire wealth on gambling and alcohol. He was within his rights since the law did not protect my cousin or her children. I could not understand why my cousin was a victim of such unfair law. My father told me that the only way to to change these conditions was to change the laws. And thus I spent almost my entire life working for equality in women's parental and custody rights, property rights, employment and income rights, divorce, the economic health of the family, and birth control. During the American Civil War, I fought for the abolition of slavery. Having been born in the early 1800s, I found my laws and practices that were so unfair to women that I set out to spend my life changing these laws and practices to ensure women's rights. I married Henry Stanton in 1840, a very <coughs> dear and supportive man. We were married for 47 years and had seven children. The same year, Henry and I attended the World's Anti-Slavery Convention in London, only to find that women were excluded from the convention floor. Outraged, I voted upon, or I vowed upon my return to the United States to create a women's organization that will fight for women's equality. And so I did. I was president of the National Women's Suffrage Association for 20 years. We believe that our cause would be to fight for women's right to vote. I became even more determined to see our cause to the end when New York gave the black man the right to vote in 1840. I opposed the 14th and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution, giving added legal protection and voting rights to African American men, while women, black and white, were denied those same rights. It was clear that we needed to assemble people who were brave and believed in the cause. We needed a meeting that would promote our message throughout the country. My dear friend Lucretia Mott and myself joined together and planned the first women's rights convention to be held in Seneca Falls, New York in 1843. We had just a week to distribute flyers introducing the meeting and thought only 30 or so people would attend. Little did we know that almost 300 people traveled to Seneca Falls to attend the convention. People such as Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth attended the convention, as well as many others that had traveled from a distance. It was a belief at the time that if women traveled in advanced pregnancy, she would lose her baby. So Lucretia Mott's sister came to the convention, seven months pregnant, and didn't lose her baby, proving the myth to be wrong. There at the convention, we wrote the document known as the Declaration of Sentiments. We fashioned it after the Declaration of Independence, and focused on human rights and women's right to vote. 
As part of my work on behalf of women's rights, I often traveled to give lectures and speeches. I had a close friendship with Susan B. Anthony, and with her, we wrote the three volumes of the History of Women's Suffrage. Always and never wavering, we called for an amendment to the United States Constitution giving women the right to vote. Unfortunately, I died at the age of 86, never witnessing the creation of such an amendment. In one of my eulogies, I was recognized as one of the more remarkable individuals in American history because of the wide spectrum of issues I spoke out on from the, from the primacy of legislatures over the courts and constitution to women's right to ride a bicycle. It was a great life. <laughs> There's an interesting, there is a, a small thing that is a I think extreme interest out of solitude itself. I don't know if any of you have read her little book. It's probably, in my estimation, it's the greatest philosopher of all time. But this is a small excerpt from it that I think that you might like. The strongest reason for giving women all the opportunities for higher education, for the full development of her faculties, for forces of mind and body, for giving her the most enlarged freedom of thought and action, a complete emancipation from all forms of bondage, of custom, dependence, superstition, from all the crippling influences of fear, is the solitude and personal responsibility of her own individual life. The strongest reasons why we ask for women to voice in the government under which she lives, in the religion she is asked to believe, equality in social life, where she is the chief factor, a place in the trades and professions where she may earn her bread, is because of her birthright to self-sovereignty, because as an individual, she must rely on herself. No matter how much women prefer to be, to be protected and supported, nor how much men desire to have them do so, they must make the voyage of life alone, and for safety in an emergency, they must know something of the laws of navigation. To guide our own craft, we must be the captain, the pilot, the engineer, the chart and compass to stand at the wheel, to watch the winds and the waves, and know when to take in the sail and to read the signs in the firmament Overall, it matters not. The solitary voyager is a man or a woman.